As Overwatch League Season 2 gets ready to begin, the Pacific Division has to feel like the little brother of the Atlantic right now. Going into Season 1, most thought that this division without a doubt was going to the Seoul Dynasty. And when that didn't happen, it left a sort of power vortex, and in the end, it was the LA Valiant that wound up on top off of a solid overall season and a Stage 4 championship. Unfortunately, they ended up getting destroyed by eventual champions, the Spitfire. Unlike the Atlantic Division, who has about three teams with an actual shot of winning, the Pacific Division is wide open, and almost every team here, new and returning, can make a case for their division crown. Before we get into this, I want to say that I've already made my casuals guide for the Atlantic Division, so if you haven't seen that yet, I highly recommend taking a look. But with that out of the way, let's see how the Pacific Division is stacking up ahead of Overwatch League Season 2. The Chengdu Hunters are the second attempt by an Overwatch League team to make a majority Chinese roster, and they seem to be trying to do what people wanted the Dragons to do in Season 1. They've brought back half of the original Miraculous Youngster squad that was the best roster in China before the Overwatch League, to Chi Ren, Lei Young, and Yang Zhao Long. They've also brought in RUI, the former coach of Miraculous Youngster, and the most recent addition of Team China that took second place in the Overwatch World Cup. Other notable pickups for this team include Eveltal, who is also a part of that second place Overwatch World Cup team, and Baking Jack, the Overwatch League's first Taiwanese player who impressed a lot in 2017 as a member of the Flash Wolves. This would be a great roster if they were together last season. As it is now, many of these players like Bacon Jack or Ying Long haven't played Overwatch professionally for about a year. A lot of their team is made up of unknown Chinese players from middling contenders China teams like Big Time Regal Gaming or Lingon Esports. This is why the Chengdu Hunters are in the bottom 5 of almost all power rankings. If this team wants to have success in Overwatch League Season 1, they need to be able to come back to the forms that they were in a year ago. But are these players past their prime? Ah, the Dallas Fuel, the most interesting enigma in Overwatch. Made from the core of Team Envy, the best non-Korean Overwatch team pre-Overwatch League, many people thought that they would smash Season 1. But they didn't. The Fuel were one of the worst teams in the League in Season 1, and yes, you can stop pointing out Stage 4. They improved, but 10th place is still 10th place. However, the Fuel had a way of giving their fans bits of hope to keep them invested. On a bad losing streak, get a few map wins against the Spitfire and Excelsior. Out of the overall playoffs, make a sudden surge in Stage 4, make the Stage playoffs, and take the Excelsior to the brink. This is why people were actually optimistic about the Fuel for Season 2. However, with the departure of Seagull at the end of the season, the Fuel had some obvious holes to fill. And I'll give them credit, they've done a pretty good job. Grabbing RCK from Team Giganti to fill their off-tank slot was a great decision. No offense to Mickey, but his off-tank play was considered to be one of the weakest in the league, and RCK has done some great things with Giganti in the European scene. The next thing this team did was sign Closer as main support. Closer was often the seventh man out in the London Spitfire's reduced roster, but the fact that the Spitfire decided to keep him when they let go of most of their bench players last season says a lot about his talent. It's likely we'll see Closer starting at main support this season, and I'll be interested to see if he gets revenge on his former team. The final big signing this team made was Zachary, and this brings me to the Fuel's main criticism, their DPS. OG and RCK are looking like a great tank line, Unko and Closer should be a great support line, but when you look at the Fuel's DPS, AKM, Effect, Taimu, and Zachary, you see a lot of hitscan. All four of them are, of course, the most comfortable with hitscan at the highest level. Even Zachary, who the Fuel signed specifically for Flex DPS, was mostly the hitscan player for Fusion University. Even if the Fuel play Zachary at Flex DPS all the time, we still have a three-person battle for the hitscan between Effect, AKM, and Taimu. This team has had internal issues before, and seeing a situation like this forming makes me kinda nervous. However, if Head Coach Arrow can prove that he can keep this team together long term, the Fuel will be a serious threat. The Charge are coming into this season as an overlooked expansion team. Sure, they were okay, but surely they didn't have enough firepower to compete with the top teams in the league. Right? Well, that's what people thought until the Charge had a show match with the Soul Dynasty a few months back. 
Disclaimer, I don't take show matches too seriously because of their nature and because of the fact that both teams were switching players in and out a lot. They were obviously experimenting with different team setups. However, after battling the Dynasty to a 2-2 draw, the Chargers are all of a sudden the sleeper pick for many fans, and it's not hard to see why. The core of the charge is made from Metabellum, which, while I never really watched them, it can't be ignored that they were semi-finalists in Contenders Korea twice in a row. They've rounded out their roster with promising Chinese and English prospects, including Eileen, the DPS star from LGD Gaming, and his main support teammate Only Wish. The team made a surprising move by picking up Kib from the British Hurricane and Team UK's Overwatch World Cup team, as well as Nero from Toronto Esports. There's a lot of hype around this roster, but the main concern about them is their mixing of nationalities. This team is in the interesting situation of being not just bilingual, but trilingual. And while the show match with the Dynasty showed good initial signs, the Charge have to prove that they can keep their team together in the long term. The Hangzhou Spark had probably the most successful branding reveal in the history of the Overwatch League so far. In a sea of teams that are predominantly red and blue colored, the Spark's cotton candy styled pink and blue has been welcomed, and when people figured out that their logo is an anime reference, which I've talked about before, it drew even more people in. The Spark have a lot of momentum right now, and they'll be looking to keep it going in the beginning of Overwatch League. The Spark are primarily a mixture of two teams. They have XX Gaming, who won Contenders Korea Season 1, and even though they dropped off in Season 2, and Seven, who, again, I was never able to watch them, but they were never able to get past the quarterfinals in Contenders Korea. While there is potential on both sides of these rosters, it's fair to say that to start the season, most eyes are on the Sparks' two Chinese members. First is Crystal, who was a star DPS player for the one winner and was on the most recent runner-up Overwatch World Cup team. And the second is Gu Shui, arguably the biggest breakout star from the most recent Overwatch World Cup. On Team China, he showed mastery of both Reinhardt and Winston and became essentially a household name. When I ask people who they're most excited to see on the Spark, more often than not, the answer will be Gu Shui. The Spark have the pieces to make a splash during their first season of the Overwatch League, and honestly, I'm excited to see how they put it all together. Alright, let's get this out of the way first. Fissure leaving the Gladiators is a pretty big deal. The impact that he had on this team cannot be understated, and he was one of the best main tanks last season. However, we've heard enough about Fissure, let's talk about all the other stuff the Gladiators have done this offseason, starting at main tank. Many people, including me, thought that Panker was going to get the call from Gladiators Legion to replace Fissure, but he's just a two-way player. Instead, the Gladiators have gotten Roar from Kangdu Panthera. Roar was one of the best main tanks in Korean Contenders last season and was a huge reason why his team was just one map off of winning Contenders Korea Season 2. He will join Bishu and Void, who are still fighting for the off-tank position. Actually, the fight to see which of these two players will be the starting off-tank slot will be interesting to watch. Along with Roar, the Gladiators also signed his teammate, the DPS Decay, who honestly I'm kinda surprised that we aren't talking about more. Decay was one of the most deadly DPS players in Korea, and it showed as bidding for him reportedly reached over $300,000. He joins an already strong DPS line in Surefor and Hydration. And joining Bigus and Shaz in the backline is Reapa, another Giganti pickup who will likely challenge Shaz for the flex support spot. While we have yet to see how the Gladiators will handle their life without Fissure, their roster on paper is extremely powerful, and they look to be ready to challenge for a playoff spot yet again. The LA Valiant are actually in a pretty similar situation as their shield-bearing counterparts. Losing soon so early into the offseason was a pretty big deal. One of the funnest Overwatch League traditions for me was hearing the crowd yell soon after he did something cool, and while I know that tradition isn't going away, the fact that it's no longer a part of the Valiant tradition is a little sad. Plus, Soon turned out to be one of the most dependable and flexible DPS players on this team, picking up players like Widowmaker quickly when his team needed him to. Now, this is where I'd usually talk about how the Valiant have gone on to fill this hole that Soon left, but the thing is, they really haven't. The only player that the Valiant acquired this offseason was Kuki, the former backup main tank of the Dynasty, and let's be honest, he's probably not going to start over Fate. Obviously, the Valiant have a lot of faith in their players, and to be fair, it's easy to see why. Fate and Space make up an extremely strong tank line. 
Custa's charisma, both on and off the stage, is a huge boost for this team at main support, and Agilities will be a great flex DPS player as always. One of the more curious moves, though, is that Kareev, who was previously a flex support for the Valiant, is listed on the website as a DPS. The Valiant actually tried to put Kareev on DPS in Stage 2 of last season, with mixed results. Could they be looking to try that again instead of KSF or Bunny? If they do, look out for Izayaki, who would be taking up the flex support slot. I've been tough on the Valiant before, but it's important to remember that this is still 5 sixths of the team that won this division last year. Could losing soon really be that bad for this team, or will we be seeing many more trips to in and out this offseason? The San Francisco Shock last season were defined by their patience. They purposefully invested in players that were under 18 years old so that they could focus on developing them. The Shock are a team planning for the long term. They're going to be a power three years down the line. They're going to, you know what, never mind, screw this plan, let's go get some Koreans. That's how I like to imagine the Shock handled this offseason. Ever since Krusty took over, the culture change in the Shock has been obvious. In the offseason, the Shock have promoted Rascal from their academy team to the main roster, which was obviously going to happen. Rascal did great with NRG and should help this team out a lot. They also signed Violet from O2 Ardeont, who should challenge Sleepy for the flex support slot. And they may have lost Dante to the Outlaws, but in return they gained Smurf, the main tank from GEA. Super didn't immediately impress in Overwatch League Season 1, so having a player to compete against him for the starting spot should be great for both of them. And of course, signing Striker is just incredible. The dude was insane for the Uprising last season, and many people would argue that he is one of the best players in the Overwatch League, period. But this brings me to one of the biggest concerns about the Shock right now, their logjam at DPS. As of right now, the team has Striker, Architect, Rascal, Sinatra, and Baby Bay at the DPS position. How the heck did the Shock decide who is going to start out of those five talented players? Not only that, but it has been pointed out by many that the Shock are just one Korean main support away from having a full Korean and Western team. There's no way that the Shock are planning to split their team up, especially after Krusty experienced it in the Uprising, right? On paper, the Shock have the tools to win this whole thing. The biggest question is if they'll be able to use them correctly. How does a team recover from being one of the biggest disappointments in Overwatch history? Well, if you're the Dynasty, I'd say you handled it pretty well. One of the biggest complaints against the Dynasty last season was their large staff of coaches. Many analysts thought that these coaches clashed with one another and left the Dynasty with a lack of an identity. They called it too many cooks in the kitchen disease. The Dynasty ended up getting rid of almost all of their coaches and are now in a much more manageable three-coach setup. I'm especially excited to see what their new head coach KDG brings to the table. He did a lot for Snakes in Europe and is a new and exciting coaching prospect. As far as their players, the Dynasty are coming in with a lot of familiar faces. Lunatic High legends like Ru Hong, Zumba, and Toby are still here. Fleta, coming off of a great performance at the Overwatch World Cup, is back as well, and Munchkin is here alongside him. However, there are a lot of new faces on the Dynasty as well. Some of the highlights include, of course, Fissure, who hopes to fill the hole left by Mira's retirement, and Jesse, an incredibly talented and talked about main support player from Element Mystic, who hopes to take the place of Gambler. The Dynasty have also invested in a few options for depth, like Fitz, who most recently played in Contenders Trials for Goldwater S and nearly made Contenders, as well as Marvel and Michelle, who make up the tank line for former Contenders China champions Lucky Future Zenith. The Dynasty made a lot of moves this season, and in my opinion did a very good job filling their holes. The Dynasty looked renewed, refreshed, and ready to take a playoff spot this year. The best thing about going 0-40 is that there is no possible way you can get a worse record next season. Seriously, since the teams play 28 games now, it's literally impossible. Even so, the Dragons took a similar route as the Mayhem and blew up nearly everything. Fearless, Kaguri, and Dia are the only three remaining after the Dragons made their cuts. Just like with the Mayhem, this was a good call. I respect this approach much more than just thinking you'll be able to compete with the same roster, because obviously you couldn't. So, who's coming to hopefully bring Shanghai their first win? Kongdu Panthera. Four players from the team that came second place in Contenders Korea Season 2 have come to the Dragons, and so has their coach Bluehaas. 
The Dragons also signed a highly anticipated DPS player in Diem. All the story of Carpe and Diem being old friends, making their names together, meeting in the Overwatch League is heartwarming. Diem also shouldn't be understated for his abilities. He was a monster for Lucky Future Zenith in China, and was a huge reason why they were able to win Contenders China twice in a row. The Dragons looked set to compete this year, but the question has to be asked, can they stay out of their own way? It's no secret that the Dragons management was a complete mess last season. Even if the Dragons players weren't quite up to the rest of the league, it was the management that ran them into the ground. If they've learned from their mistakes last season, look at the Dragons as a sleeper pick for the playoffs. After months of waiting and hoping, it happened. Runaway is finally in the Overwatch League. The story of Runaway is incredible. It's a story of hardship, of family, of coming up from nothing to become one of the most loved teams in all of Overwatch. That's why when the team got picked up in its entirety for Overwatch League Season 2, the entire community celebrated. Some of the more notable members of the Runaway roster, if you aren't familiar, include Haxel, someone who's been on Runaway since practically the beginning, and has wowed audiences for years with his Genji play. And Bumper, the ultra-versatile main tank who has had the chain trolls completely twice for Runaway and is still one of the best main tanks in Korea today. Honestly, I could say more, but I would honestly recommend watching Action Esports' newest video about the Vancouver Titans if you want to learn more about these players. They do a very good job going into detail about the history of every player on this roster, much better than I could do considering I wasn't in the community for their most famous moments in Apex. If you're interested, I'll leave a link in the description. There are a couple concerns already forming, though. First is the fact that Runaway never won a title until Overwatch League had already begun. They had gotten close, sure, but they were never able to take home a victory against the world's most talented teams. What's to say that Overwatch League will be any different? Secondly, word is that the Titans haven't actually touched down in LA yet. Unlike most of the other teams, they're still in Korea. When they do eventually get here, they will have very little time to get accustomed to LA and their new homes and the jet lag before they're on stage for their first game. This could lead to the team coming off to a slow start, but with a team that has such a colorful history as the Titans do, they should be prepared for anything. Unlike the Atlantic Division, the Pacific Division is wide open this season. I could legitimately see 9 of these teams with a legitimate chance to come out on top. Sorry Chengdu. However, on paper, I'm going to have to tentatively give it to the Shock. They are absolutely stacked, and if they can use their roster correctly, I can see them competing with the most powerful teams in the Atlantic Division. I'm going to give second place to the LA Gladiators and third to the Seoul Dynasty because I really like how both of these teams handled their offseason. I think both of them will get a playoff spot. After that, it's just a mess. I honestly had a lot of trouble ranking this division, so I mostly just decided to stay true to my power rankings. I can't wait to be wrong. And there you go, the Casuals Guide to Overwatch League Season 2 is complete. I hope you enjoyed watching it as much as I enjoyed making it, and here's to a great Overwatch League Season 2. Is there anything that you think I missed or got wrong? As always, let me know in the comments, and if you enjoyed this video, leave a like and subscribe, because my goal is to be making weekly videos for Overwatch League, and with Season 2 right around the corner, you don't want to miss them. Until next time though, that's all for me. Don't get tilted!